So it is uh, Friday night, uh, a week before Pro Tour Magic Origins, and I am currently in Dallas. Uh, I have been here since Wednesday, uh, testing for the Pro Tour. Uh, we'll be playing in the Grand Prix over the weekend, and uh, I actually am not a huge fan of playing Grand Prix the weekend for Pro Tours, uh, but the group that I'm testing with, uh, with lots of people who were interested in playing the Grand Prix, uh, so we've just been here for the week. Uh, basically Wednesday to Wednesday, flying out to Vancouver on uh, next Wednesday, right before the Pro Tour. So uh, I'm actually testing with a different group for this event. Uh, I hadn't been really particularly happy with how my testing and results had been uh, in the you know, recent events, testing with uh, the CFB group, and decided to try something new. Um, so I'm actually working with a group that includes a lot of uh, Star City writers, including uh, Brad Nelson, uh, Jerry Thompson, Brian Bronduin, uh, Ross Merriam, uh, as well as uh, a number of other people, uh, Chris Fennell, Ari Lax, uh, Tom Martell, Austin Bursevich, uh, Michael Majors, I think that pretty much is everyone, but uh, anyway, uh, I've had pre previously worked with uh, both Brad and Jerry, uh, and you know, really enjoy working with them, I think they're both very, uh, very... Uh, Hardworking guys who have a lot of good ideas and good perspective on things. So uh, I hadn't really worked with much of the rest of the group before, so uh, it's a new experience. But uh, so far, it's been good. Um, definitely a different environment than testing with uh, with the CFB crowd, uh, a younger crowd, and uh, I don't know, a different different atmosphere. But uh, but anyway, it's been it's been good. Um, so I, I originally came to testing really looking to explore with a lot of the new cards from Origins pretty heavily. Um, the, one of the cards that, that I was really interested in exploring was uh, Archangel of Tithes. But uh, I made a bunch of decks that had it, and it just, they just didn't seem that impressive. The, the card itself was very good. The problem was the rest of the shell surrounding it in decks um, was pretty limited because of its casting cost. Triple White is pretty tough to support. And frankly, just the... All the components of the decks that I was playing felt like they were better suited in other decks. Um, like, for instance, I was playing you know, versions that had uh, you know, Valor Stance, and there were Green White with like Lion and Valor Stance and Jermokas Command. It's like, well, my Lions and Jermokas Commands and Valor Stances and Den Protectors are all good. Um, and Archangel can be good, but it, it didn't really feel like it, it was it was really worth the sacrifice of giving up cards like Elvish Mystic or Deathless Raptor because of the casting cost. So I then explored some other decks uh, with a variety of weird stuff like Relic Seeker. But again, the you know the white creatures I found just aren't good enough uh, in a world where people are playing with Sylvan Karyatids and uh, Courses of Crufix and things like that. You just can't attack. You know, you're a tutu, you can't really attack. Um, and while there are cards that can buff your, your team, not many of them are really that good. Um, Spear of Heliod in particular is vulnerable to Dromokas Command, and uh, you don't really have breakers. You don't really have ways to break through if your opponent has cards like Elspeth or Language. There's no Brave the Elements, there's no Boros Charm, Close Games Out, things like that. Um, Kithian was another card that I was exploring that was actually pretty powerful when it got online in the right circumstances, but uh, also didn't really... Uh, didn't really live up to the hopes that I had for him, largely because he's just contextually poorly positioned in the standard format uh, with what the popular decks are. Uh, what I expect to be the most popular decks uh, at the Pro Tour would be most likely Devotion and Abzan, uh, with various forms of control probably following that up. It's possible that Red has a, another breakout performance like it did at Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir, but uh, I don't really haven't really found a Red deck that we're particularly excited about, though I don't think people are particularly excited about red, so they're not really trying very hard to find one. It's always a problem that, you know, people have whatever decks that they specifically want to play, and obviously I'm guilty of this too, wanting to play various forms of creature decks, um, so you end up having some avenues that aren't necessarily explored as, as deeply as they could be. Um, one card that I think is actually super powerful in the new set that we have done some exploration of uh, is the new Jace. Uh, I think that maybe that and Nissa, those two I think are the best cards in the new set. Um, this is extremely powerful and actually is a big part of the sort of new version of Green White that I'm currently working on. Um, it just gives gives you a, you know, just an early play that helps sort of the cogs in the machine keep going um, and ensure that you hit your land drops. 
but also has the impact of uh, late game just becoming this huge, huge card drawing threat that your opponent has to deal with. And uh, adding that dimension to something which you know has an early game impact is really effective. Uh, Jace is also super powerful. Uh, we have a number of sort of Esper or Blue Black or whatever other combination of control decks that use Jace. Uh, and it's a very powerful card. It's very easy to get online very quickly. Uh, it's very hard for people to kill because of uh, the fact that it has such high loyalty and uh, and it can you know, give give creatures minus attack. So you very often will have Jace setting up like multiple languishes or heroes downfalls or whatever else and becoming uh, pretty much a, able to single handedly win the game. Um, it's not clear how good those decks are if people are playing decks that actually have cheap removal that would otherwise be stranded in their hands against you. Um, I know that one of the one of the things that I found when I was playing uh, various forms of like Greeno Dragons or Teamer or whatever else was uh, I would lose many of the games where I would end up drawing my burn spells because those aren't very good unless you're able to get enough damage in. And uh, if But if your opponent has Jace to give you a target for them that's actually reasonably efficient, uh, that's a, a different story. So um, it, it de definitely has been performing very well against our various Abzan green-white style of decks. Um, but I think that against red decks uh, or against decks that are heavy on cards like Dermokus Command that would otherwise be dead, uh, it may be less impressive. Uh, one, one deck that I definitely want to explore is actually uh, blue-red with both Jace and Chandra. I've been really impressed by Chandra, um, at least in limited. <laughs> um, but it's actually a card that's very easy to enable and construct it. Like, if your opponent has, has a creature and you kill that creature with Chandra and then, uh, you know, with a spell, pinging them with Chandra, then attack with Chandra, Chandra flips. It's actually quite easy. And a Planeswalker that can plus to deal two damage to your opponent uh, and has a very threatening ultimate is no joke. Uh, so, in ha having uh, a Jason in the deck that like that, that you're able to potentially reuse burn spells, and you can flip Jace quite quickly because you have you know a number of spells and such to fill your graveyard. Uh, it's definitely definitely a pretty exciting uh, prospect, I think. So, uh, I'm interested in uh, in checking that out as well. You don't unfortunately have fetch lands if you're playing that. You can play some off color fetches, but you don't have a blue red fetch land in standard. So you don't have the ability to fill your graveyard quite as quickly for Jace as in some of the color combinations that do have fetch lands naturally. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, feel reasonably comfortable with the limited format. I, I do like the fact that if we are forced to play in a Grand Prix this weekend, or I guess I feel forced, <laughs> uh, it, it's at least a uh, a format that's relevant for the Pro Tour. It's not you know off constructed format like there. I played in a. A modern Grand Prix before a standard Pro Tour, and it felt like such a horrible uh, kind of waste of time for prime testing time during the weekend before the event. Uh, here, though, uh, you know, playing Magic Origins Sealed Deck and Draft is definitely useful preparation, even if it's not the most efficient use of time actually going to the venue and, and waiting between rounds and things like that. So, hope we can make the best of it, and maybe, you know, who knows, at least someone will do well, maybe I'll do well. Um, I'm not really particularly invested in my own performance in the Grand Prix because I don't really have a number of pro points that any results from the Grand Prix would particularly influence my end of season finish, but, you know, whatever, I like to do well in tournaments, so. But my focus is on the Pro Tour, as it always is. Uh, so I'm going to be thinking about decks and obviously thinking about draft and everything while I'm playing in the tournament, and uh, hopefully getting in good position to do well next weekend in Vancouver. So anyway, that's it for now. Um, I will report back later with more, and uh, I'll see you soon.
So it is uh, Wednesday morning uh, before the Pro Tour. Uh, I'm actually sitting out by the pool, the the house we uh, have been renting for the past week uh, just outside Dallas. Uh, we're heading to Vancouver today, so uh, not too much time left before the actual tournament starts. Uh, this past weekend, uh, as I said before, we all played in the Grand Prix, uh, which yeah, as I as I said, I wasn't super excited to actually play in because I felt like I'd rather use my time uh, actually playtesting for the tournament. Uh, but I ended up uh, going seven and two, uh, despite not really having a very good deck uh, on day one, and then uh, ended up ten and five overall because I conceded twice on day two to players, uh, friends of mine who needed uh, pro points, whereas I really don't. So, uh, you know. Definitely weird sort of spot with the uh, the the whole tournament in general. The water sprinklers just came on in the pool, but <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I uh, I, I felt like my uh, my decks in the Grand Prix from the drafts were were solid, and uh, you know, I I was originally actually just gonna leave uh, uh, after the first draft when I conceded for the first time to uh, to a friend of mine in the last round of that draft. Uh, but decided I might as well stick around to uh, do the second drafts because you know whatever I'm getting getting practice doing an actual draft in the format. Uh, and then my deck seemed pretty sweet, so I wanted to play it. And then I just didn't lose a match. So uh, you know, definitely at least a uh, I, I at least won some money from the, uh, the the tournament, even though I didn't get any pro points myself and was able to help out some people. So um, as for constructed. Uh, pretty much everyone else seems to be, well not everyone, most other people seem to be pretty set on playing uh, the green Devotion deck, um, similar to the one that uh, Brad and others played at the Star City Standard Open in Chicago uh, the weekend before last. Uh, I don't really feel comfortable playing that deck because I feel like it is the deck people are trying to beat. I think it's the deck that has the biggest targets on its, on its back of any deck in the format. I don't think it's powerful enough to overcome that. Uh, you know, we, we even just saw this past weekend at the Open Series in Richmond, uh, a number of players, including you know Todd Anderson, uh, Chris Van Meter, playing uh, Heroic, which is a deck that is largely targeting Devotion. And I would not, I would not be surprised to see the same thing happen at the Pro Tour because I do think Devotion will be a major player. Uh, I do think that the the success of Ray Todic, uh with his Rally deck. Uh, which I think is a much better version of Rally than the one that put up results at the previous uh, Standard Open. Uh, it definitely has the potential to have an impact on the Pro Tour. Uh, we've been playing with that deck and it does seem quite strong, though it is somewhat fragile to a number of different things. Uh, it's one card that is actually amusingly poor against because of its reliance on the sacrifice effect effects is Hanger Backwalker. Um, which has actually become a fixture of a lot of the decks and sideboards that we've been messing with. Uh, specifically, uh, I, I'm looking at almost certainly playing green-white in the tournament. Uh, I, I've been having a lot of success with it in testing. I think it's a strong deck that doesn't really have any particularly bad matchups among popular decks. It's one of the only decks that uh, that I think is favored against red decks, which I think are always overrepresented. Uh, in, in formats when you know Red just has powerful cards that people don't really don't really pay a ton of attention. It's possible that it gets kind of less uh, less popular because of the existence of Languish, but Languish is still pretty slow against Red if you if you have a very aggressive draw. So uh, playing Fleecebane Lion is pretty exciting in that that kind of format. But regardless, um, my sprayer thing, <laughs> my. Uh, my sideboard actually includes four copies of Hangerback Walker and two copies of Evolutionary Leap, uh, which gives you the ability to actually play like a really, really long, grindy game against any kind of control deck because you can just continue to pump up your walkers, sacrifice them in a leap, then sacrifice each of the counters to leap to just keep getting more cards. Uh, I actually played a game against a Esper Dragon deck where we basically just went until I almost decked myself and uh, I, you know, the, the game, there were so many weird things happening in the game. I ultimately ended up losing the game, but, uh, I, you know, my opponent was at 20-something in, like, turn 7, and I still felt like I was ahead. Uh, but, you know, the plan is so powerful that I, uh, I think that it gives the deck uh, this really, really strong plan uh, in late game against control decks that uh, make it difficult to beat. So I like that. And then I, I also, there's just also just, like, a lot of just solid stuff that you can play. I think Tragic Arrogance is a super powerful card. 
uh, in particular in a deck that can play stuff like Boon Seder, um, and you can choose your Boon Seder as an enchantment, another thing as a creature, and end up with you know a lot of stuff in play against you know just just an opposing single creature. Uh, it's one of the best cards against the Devotion decks. If they don't have a Whisperwood Elemental in play, you basically just leave them with exactly one Elf against whatever you keep. Uh, and I also think that that. Uh, Boon Seder and uh, Ajani Mentor of Heroes are both very effective at giving you ways to uh, to have languish survivable creatures. The, the fact that languish only kills smaller creatures means that if you're loading up counters or uh, enchanting things with Boon Seder, you can frequently keep your board when your opponent casts languish, and that's a big deal. Um, the big thing, as far as just like individual card choices, is that I uh, I don't really like Collected Company. I think the Collected Company in the standard decks, it simply just gives you more uh, more of the same in terms of the cards that weren't beating your opponent at that moment anyway. It is good against against Wrath Effects. It's good against Language. It's not good against something like Elspeth. And there's so many creatures in the deck that like you don't really particularly want to get face up anyway. Like getting a Den Protector off of your Collected Company is not very exciting. So basically, rather than 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 uh, Den Protector, I have more sort of aggressive stuff in the form of Boon Seder, as well as the Ajani Venture of Heroes, which give you a really strong long game. So, uh, but that's basically where I stand right now. I'm pretty happy with the deck. Uh, I'll have it finalized, you know, obviously in the next day or so because the Pro Tour starts on Friday. Uh, but heading off to Vancouver in about an hour, I think. So uh, yeah, I will check in again before the Pro Tour starts, and uh, we'll see how things go. Uh, hello everyone. It is what Thursday night uh, before the Pro Tour. The Pro Tour is tomorrow morning and uh, that means that you know basically everything is set. All of the preparations, uh, everything is uh, coming to a close and it is time for the tournament itself and I'm feeling good. Uh, I've been you know, pretty much set on uh, my deck since uh, I don't know, early this week. Uh, I've been very happy with how it's performing uh, and the more I sort of hear about what kind of decks people are playing or people expect people to play, uh, the sort of the happier I am with my choice. Uh, I'm playing you know, Green White Aggro, um, very similar, at least in, th in overall sort of structure, to the deck that I played at the last Pro Tour, uh, but it you know, has a lot of pretty meaningfully different card choices that I think make it a lot stronger overall. Um, you know, I'm, one of the things that I really wanted to do uh, was just play with what I think is the best card in the format, which is Elf Course, Elfish Mystic, which I've played uh, in various forms for a long time. Um, and uh, I think that, that, you know, there's a couple directions you can go with Elfish Mystic. One is the uh, using Mystic to play more mana creatures and really big stuff, which is Devotion, which is what most of the rest of my testing group is playing. Uh, my my deck, though, uh, is a lot lower to the ground. You know, I'm playing the, the sort of Megamorph shell of... Uh, of Den Protector and Deathmiss Raptor, who we've seen quite a bit of, and which also was included in my last uh, my last Pro Tour deck. I'm even playing Hidden Dragon Slayer, uh, in part because I think that the deck wants another uh, early drop other than Fleece Man Line, who is the best of them, uh, but also because there are quite a few powerful 4-plus creatures out there that you want to be able to actually kill, and you only want so many Valor Stances, which is uh, one of the best cards available as far as sort of general utility for a creature deck, uh, but is quite weak in matchups where you're not really getting uh, the ability to kill things with, or like, you know, uh, you don't necessarily get great value out of the indestructible element of it against cards like Languish. Um, you know, my deck uses Corsair, Nissa, Boon Seder for sort of mid-game threat, um, and also uh, Ajani. Uh, so the, the combination of Nissa and Ajani uh, gives the deck actually a pretty powerful long game in, in matchups that can go sort of attrition-based uh, in part because, you know, they just give you this this uh, ability to actually do something powerful, which a lot of green white decks, you know, will have something with Raptor, but like, you know, you don't necessarily have the ability to sort of take over a game when your opponent has gotten to be able to actually play their big stuff. That was one big reason that I didn't like Collected Company uh, when, you know, I was playing uh, other versions of green white with that card. In a lot of cases, you would just collect a company into two creatures that don't really do that much you know what's your best what's your best bet you know like sort of the mid late game of collected company you can get you know fleece man lion that's what your hope is yeah uh, you're maybe maybe a raptor and a fleece man lion it's like if you're really you know get a really good collected company and that doesn't really do anything if your opponent has something like elspeth in play or uh you know something like that uh, whereas uh ajani 
which is kind of the, the direction that I went instead, uh, can actually win games when your opponent has sort of gone big by both digging you to additional threats as well as uh, pumping up a den protector. Uh, that's actually the way that this deck wins a lot of games, is just making a really big den protector your opponent can't block, uh, just killing them with it. That's a, a big part of the reason I think Boon Seder is a pretty key card in this particular deck. I played Boon Seder at the last Pro Tour, uh, and it was it was pretty good. Uh, Boon Seder also just gives you the, a lot of the same tactical advantage that you can get from Collected Company in that you can end step threats. You know, your opponent, uh, you don't necessarily have to have to commit mana to the uh, adding stuff to the board and your opponent, you know, if they play a sweeper or if they don't, you can still deploy a threat. And it also actually happens to work really well, uh, both Boon Seder and Ajani, against Languish. Uh, because Languish, you know, doesn't kill big things. It only kills things with, with uh, toughness four or less. Uh, both Ajani and Boon Seder can actually get your sort of middle-sized mi uh, creatures out of the range of Languish. You can actually keep them alive despite your opponent casting Languish. And uh, their plan is to wipe your board, but you actually can end up with a really big guy left in play. So, um, and, and I think the deck is, is, is very solid. I've been happy with it performing in, in pretty much all the matchups that I've been trying. Um, the, the fact that the Nissa and Ajani give you, you know, this late game plan uh, definitely helps a lot against control decks. Uh, and, and the deck just be, you know, being a just solid, fast, green-white creature deck uh, happens to line up very well against other aggressive decks in general. So I'm happy playing the deck against red decks, I'm happy playing the deck against Abzan, Devotion. Uh, you know, some of them definitely, you know, can come down to just who gets the better draw, who draws first, but that's, you know, also just magic. Um, but uh, I really like my sideboard plans, too. Uh, one of the big ones is this combo of Hangerback Walker and Evolutionary Leap. Uh, the idea here is that Hangerback Walker is really good against decks that are, uh, are, are trying to just beat you with removal effects, basically. Uh, you can get a Hangerback in play, uh, start ratcheting it up, and eventually, you know, it pops for a bunch of 1-1 creatures, which can f happen to fly over Elspeth tokens, kill that. Uh, and if, you know, your opponent doesn't necessarily pop it themselves, well, you can use Evolutionary Leap. This is a card that uh, goes very well with not only hanger back, but also with uh, just mana creatures that you may you may draw late, uh, with raptors when you have den protector and things like that. That just allows you to keep you know sort of cycling your guys. You might be getting killed into new creatures uh, against Abzan. Uh, one of the, the the problems with something like Walker would be okay. Well, they just Abzan charm it. You don't get the death trigger. But if you have evolutionary leap, you can kill it in response to any sort of uh, any sort of removal effect that might exile it, like Abzan charm, uh, and not only still get your tokens from it, but uh, get an additional card from it as well. So that's quite a powerful effect. Uh, the other big sort of cyborg card that uh, I, th I think is going to be kind of a breakout card of this tournament is Tragic Arrogance. Uh, Tragic Arrogance is a card that can allow uh, creature decks. Uh, to sort of catch up, like without necessarily having to, you know, play just an actual board sweeper. When you tragic arrogance, it's kind of it, it's kind of a similar effect in a lot of cases to uh, like a a crux of fate. You know, you get to you get to choose a big guy of yours six around um, and you know make your opponent. You know, if they're playing as devotion, it's like okay, your elf stays around and I keep my you know big guy. And if you have stuff like Hangerback or Boon Seder or Corsair or Planeswalker, you can keep those too. So you can actually as long as you have multiple different types in play, you can generally sculpt the board so you're hugely advantaged. So that's a, that's a big one of the cyber cards. And then I also heard that, uh, well, A, I'm playing Hangerback myself. My my team has has anticipated that card to be potentially a popular one in this tournament. Uh, and we, we've heard some rumblings. There may be some teams also playing uh, artifact-based decks. So I'm actually playing three copies of Unravel the Aether. Uh, if you know I run into Hangerback, it's a great card. You can actually take out Hangerback without triggering its... Uh, it's Death Trigger, and then just some other utility stuff with Hushwing Griff against uh, stuff like Devotion or uh, or Enchantress uh, Constellation, as they call it these days. And then uh, Valorous Stance and a Glare of Heresy for some more utility. So overall, just you know, I'm happy with the deck, uh, happy with the preparation. I feel like it was it was nice to uh, you know work with this group, uh, many of whom have similar sort of thoughts about things like. You know, there was consensus among people that Elvish Mystic is just the best card, and building the best Elvish Mystic deck is what we want to be doing. Um, 
and you know, well, obviously, I think that there is there's a lot of value to having people with differing opinions. Um, it was it was definitely nice to have uh, have people who were interested in my ideas and, and supporting uh, sort of the directions that I was going. I got a lot of good feedback from uh, from Jerry in particular. I think you know I love working with Jerry, and uh, you know we we sort of talked a lot through the various cyber plans and uh, sort of how we came with to the the hangar back leap plan, which I think is is, is very strong. Um, but yeah, so you know, uh, Pro Tour starts in the morning. I'm like I said, I'm feeling confident, feeling good. Don't think you know that my deck is is some absolutely outrageously broken, powerful thing. But I think it's a very good deck. Uh, it's very solid, and I think it has a lot of, of strong matchups with what I expect to see, and uh, you know, certainly something I'm familiar with, and I expect to be able to play well. So uh, you know, I also feel great in the draft format. Did uh, did well at the Grand Prix. I've done well in sort of all the practice drafts that. Uh, we were doing around the house that we were renting uh, in Texas, so you know, can't really complain. Think, uh, think I'm feeling good going to this event. I didn't even have you know an opportunity to just kind of hang out and relax. Um, I actually uh, you know, visited some of my family who live in Texas while I was there. Um, actually went and hung out at the the, the uh, Hearthstone Team Archon house for a couple hours uh, the other afternoon. Just kind of you know, got to chill there and. Uh, and just you know play some games and stuff. And I mean you know there's there's something to be said for focused preparation and and sort of boot camping in the week or so before uh, before the pro tour. Uh, but at the same time you know it's easy to get sort of burned out if you focus you know too much and don't uh, don't find other things to enjoy yourself doing. You don't want to be going into the pro tour and hating magic because you know you've been doing nothing but playing magic for the past you know week and a half or whatever. So but yeah I'm excited to play. Uh, I'm feeling good and uh, yeah. Looking forward to it. So anyway, I will check back in when uh, I have more info later in the tournament. Bye. It is, what, Friday night, uh, after day one of the Pro Tour, uh, just finished up, and I finished it at five and three, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good record. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the last shred of hope record, basically. Uh, if you're, you, know, you can make day two at four and four, but you're basically not making top eight from that record. At five and three, uh, if you go undefeated on the second day, you do have a shot at top eight, and frankly, that's my goal. My goal is to win the tournament, so still being live for that is, uh, is good. Uh, I went one and two in the draft portion, which was a little frustrating, because I had what I felt was a, a pretty strong deck. I had a tough table. Uh, I had Kai Buda, uh, Game Wafo Tapa, David Williams, all three. I had Lucas Blohan as well, uh, all four at my table. Um, you know, two Hall of Famers and two other players with uh, Pro Tour top eights. So pretty, pretty tough table to start the tournament with. And I beat Dave, uh, lost to uh, a Japanese player who I did not recognize. Uh, and then lost to Wafo Tapa in the last round. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I kind of had a, you know some mulligans and mana problems with my with my deck, and uh, you know whatever that is, that's magic. I uh, I would have I would have been happy with a two and one, uh, very happy with a three and zero, oh, uh, but one and two always kind of frustrating, especially when you feel like you have a good deck. Um, in the standard portion, uh, I, I went four and one. Uh, I think my deck was was excellent for the field, uh, and I'm actually pretty excited to get back to standard tomorrow because I feel like my uh, my deck lines up very well against a lot of what uh, many of the players who are doing well are playing. Uh, it's There's a lot of the blue-red artifact deck, which uh, we sort of anticipated, and thankfully I have three copies of uh, Unravel the Aether in my deck, and Dromokus Command also very, very good against the Soul Artifact, uh, as well as Valor Stance and Hidden Dragons there was actually a card that I uh, managed to get some value off of against a uh, an Soul. So, I was actually my one loss today uh, was to the blue red artifact deck. 
<coughs> um, I actually had like a very weird game one where you know I ended up hidden dragon slaying his ghost fire blade with soul artifact, and then uh, you, having to use Dramoka's command to pump my dragon slayer and fight his hanger back just because I'd taken so much damage, so I wanted to get a you know, bunch of extra life that turn and get his hanger back off the table. Then he played a Thopter spy, spy Network, and we played a really long game where he had the network in play for a long time, uh, and I never found a Den Protector or a second Dromoka's Command, so he just ultimately got so much value off of his network that he was able to swing the game around. Um, then the second game, I ended up... I, I could have definitely could have played the game better to, to win the game. Um, I ended up losing to... Basically losing to playing Den Protector on turn three, uh, because he had a Wild Slash that he used to kill my Den Protector. My thought was that I wanted to be able to use my Unravel on turn four and immediately return it with Den Protector so I could play three drop and Unravel again on turn five. Um, but he ended up having a Wild Slash that he used to kill my Den Protector, which, again, we played a pretty long game. And if, I, if I'd gotten a little bit more value, if I'd been able to use the Unravel twice, because he actually negated my Unravel when I did play it, uh, I think that I would have won the game, so... Uh, you know, I think my deck is great, and I think that you know the experience that I've gotten playing in some of the decks that are popular will definitely help me do better with it tomorrow. So uh, hopefully the draft goes well, and then I get to get back to playing my sweet, sweet standard deck. So anyway, uh, off to can have a, uh, a sweet dinner at some you know food network popular I don't know dim sum dumpling place or something like that, and uh, then get to get some sleep and rest up for tomorrow. So I'll be back with more action then. All right, it is uh, Sunday morning, actually. Uh, uh, after day two of the Pro Tour yesterday, I decided to just go uh, get some food and drinks rather than record my uh, my video log right away. But uh, it, day two was, was was tough. Day two of the Pro Tour was tough. Um, I started the, the day five and three, <clears throat> having gone uh, one and two in the first draft and four and one in constructed in day one. And uh, I drafted what... I, what you know, I thought, and what many people, you know, who looked at it, pretty much everyone, you know, all the pros who looked at it, uh, considered you know, a very strong deck. Uh, and unfortunately, I failed to win a single match with it. Uh, I drafted a blue-black control deck. Blue-black is my least favorite color combination in uh, in limited in Origins, uh, but with the right cards, it can be you know a very powerful deck. And I had a languish, uh, a guilt leaf winnower. Uh, There's an interesting story about it actually. Uh, at my pod, three people in a row all opened. Uh, Planeswalkers. They all opened Planeswalkers in a row in pack one. Uh, it was uh, Ari Lax opened Jace, uh, Neil Oliver to his left opened uh, Gideon, and the player to their left opened Liliana. Uh, and I was two seats to the left of the player opening Liliana, um, and I opened uh, a pack with several good black cards, and I actually decided that I was going to take a black card pretty much before I even saw my pack. Uh, because I was I was sure that the player uh, behind the player uh, the player who opened Liliana would not take a black card, uh, and ultimately I first picked Cruel Revival and got past Guiltleaf Winnower, um, because you know, the player was was uh, set on not drafting black behind the player uh, with Liliana who was clearly going to be drafting black because he took the Liliana, so that was pretty interesting. Um, but unfortunately, that Winnower didn't really do very much in my games. Um, I, I lost the first round uh, to. Uh, to Neil Oliver's really aggressive red deck, uh, where he played turn one glob goblin glory chaser in both games. Uh, I was on the draw in the first game and uh, could not block it with my feeded imp, and I was in the play second game and my two drop was a shambling ghoul. So it was a little awkward and I just kind of got crushed in the first match. Uh, I then lost to Arilax, uh, who had Will Bender, Will Breaker, Will Breaker and Whirler Rogue sort of comboed to steal a bunch of stuff in game one. When I finally killed the Will Bender, Will Binder, Will Breaker, Will Smith, I don't know. Um, he just killed me with the Whirler Rogue with his Sentinel Spiders. Um, and that would sort of be a theme of my next match as well. I played against a green-white deck who also had uh, multiple giant 6-6s. Six I already had two Sentinel Spiders, uh, as well as Gaia's Revenge and uh, Ali Hemeret or whatever, the, the Sphinx. Uh, so my deck, which was would it would normally be great against green decks with uh, you know a bunch of uh, Guardians of Miletus. I had three Guardians of Miletus in my deck along with Languish. Uh, as well as some some uh, removal spells for large creatures, but unfortunately there were just too many big creatures. Uh, you know, I already had multiple six sixes, and then my finals, uh, my my last round opponent in the draft also had multiple six sixes, and uh, I just wasn't able to, to to deal with them. And it was, you know, I, I think just a matter of the way that my deck ended up specifically lining up against the types of decks that I played against, and I just ended up going zero three. Um, 
so it was, it was yeah, pretty frustrating, uh, particularly considering if I had a good draft, uh, I felt like my constructed deck was great, and I thought that I had a really good chance of uh, potentially making top eight. Um, well, I was right about that that point about my constructed deck being great because I won all of my constructed matches yesterday, uh, leaving my standard record at nine and one for the tournament. Uh, and despite going one in five overall in draft, uh, ended up in about seventieth place and still made money in the tournament. Um, so. You know, it's it's always frustrating to have a particular format kind of let you down. Uh, interestingly, at the Pro Tour Dragons Dark Year, I actually, I think I went 4-2 and two in draft and then did very poorly uh, in the standard portion. Uh, and, you know, I just need to uh, need to actually get both of those going at the same time, I guess. Um, I felt really well prepared for draft, and I don't think either of my decks were bad. Um, but I think that, you know, I probably could have played a bit differently in a couple of spots. Um, one thing, you know, particularly given that Magic Online uh, is not something that I really use much anymore. Um, I don't really play that much limited, and I'm sure that there are a number of spots where I could have made better decisions if I were more practiced, just in in playing limited in general. Like, I played a lot of drafts uh, over the past couple weeks. Uh, you know, I, I played in the Grand Prix, and I did well in the Grand Prix, and I... Uh, you know, was practicing in all of our, our house drafts and, you know, did pretty well in all of them. I, I had a winning record in almost all of our, our house drafts. And, you know, it was it was uh, disappointing, very disappointing to uh, do so poorly in the drafts of the Pro Tour after that practice. Um, but it, it was heartening to know that my constructed deck was great um, and, you know, a little better, a little better draft performance than maybe uh, I would be playing today, right now. Uh, but anyway... Um, I, I still have next week to uh, potentially play standard again in San Diego at that Grand Prix. Uh, so we'll, we'll see about uh, avenging my finish here at that event. Uh, but overall, you know, I, I think that, that I was pretty happy with you know, my preparation um, and, and everything for this event. Uh, the, the you know team that I worked with was a, things were a little haphazard. You know, it, was, it was a group that I hadn't worked with before, um, and they hadn't necessarily worked together before very much either. Um, so you know, there were not necessarily everyone was on the same page, but I, mean, I did feel I did feel like I was well prepared for the tournament. Um, amusingly, everyone after the tournament was like, well, "Wish I'd played your deck." I'm like, "Well, <laughs> I told you it was good." Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I mean it was uh, it was definitely a fun event, um, and. You know, I'm looking forward to you know competing in the the, the, the next Pro Tours uh, next year. I guess there's still one this year. There's there's Milwaukee toward the end of the year. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do for my preparation for those. Uh, you know, I'm going to sort of figure that out as things go. You know, the, the the group that I'm working with now, um, you know, maybe maybe some some combination of people from that, maybe another group entirely. Who knows? Um, but I mean, I. Uh, you know, I definitely want to do well at these tournaments. Uh, I, I, you know, I talked to a lot of people who, you know, I was I was explaining how you know a big part of my sort of thought process with approaching approaching Magic now because you know I am in the Hall of Fame and I have a lot of other sort of competing demands on my time. Um, you know, I I don't play as much Magic as I used to, um, but I do still you know want to spend the time preparing the Pro Tours to be able to do well at them because I'm a, a very competitive person and I want to play in these tournaments and do well. Um, so, you know, even if I'm not going to nearly as many Grand Prix as I did, because Grand Prix are generally, when you're already qualified, unless you're chasing, like, the top levels or worlds or something, um, are not a particularly great value proposition. And I, I, frankly, I'm just, I don't, don't enjoy traveling to tournaments as much as, as I used to. Uh, not to say that I even did a lot of time when I was. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there was a period when I was traveling to a tournament, you know, pretty much every other weekend, and uh, that just got really, really really, really tiring really quickly. Um, but, you know, I, I really enjoy my relationship with Magic now. Um, I still play, you know, on Magic Online at least uh, at least a couple times a week because I, uh, I do produce my videos for Star City and, you know, I was previously doing the Standard Super League, uh, but I got I got last place in that because everyone just kept trying to beat my green decks. <laughs> but, uh, but, no, I mean, I... Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to having more opportunities next weekend, even, uh, at, at the Grand Prix in San Diego, because I don't really have to fly anywhere for that, because I live there. Um, and, you know, hopefully I will uh, get to explore some more with uh, with this sweet deck that I had for this tournament, and maybe someday I'll win draft match, who knows. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, the, the tournament overall, I think, was, was pretty sweet. Um, a lot of, of people I know who uh, either needed or, uh, you know, were sort of 
for a long time looking for breakout performances did very well. Um, Pat Cox apparently just needs to uh, have the threat of falling off the Pro Tour and he makes top eight. Same thing happened at the last Pro Tour last season. He's like, I have to top eight to make gold or whatever. It's like, it just makes top eight. So it's good motivation, I guess. Maybe uh, maybe if, if I didn't have that Hall of Fame invite, I would uh, I would be in a similar position. But um, but yeah, no, uh, Matt Sperling, um, Stephen Neal, a, a Madison area player who I've actually known for quite a while, who's never really had uh, a breakup performance before this, uh, Stephen Berrios, so, yeah, who actually beat me at the Grand Prix last weekend. So, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, you know, people doing well at this tournament who need it or deserve it, <laughs> or both. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm gonna actually gonna head over to the site pretty soon, uh, go check that out in person. Uh, I was actually catching a little bit of the coverage on my laptop before I decided to record this. Um, so anyway, uh, that's really going to be it. I may, uh, may pop in with some more, you know, little random video things, but, uh, you know, not a, a particularly, uh, I don't know, successful pro tour. I mean, I did make money. I got the you know, 70th place or whatever, one of thousand dollars or whatnot. And I do feel happy about the fact that I was able to identify what I think is, uh, you know, a great deck for the metagame that, that ultimately showed up at the pro tour. Um, but it's always, you know, I always want to do better. I always want to, you know, actually make the top eight, be the person who's uh, who's there playing on Sunday for the uh, for the trophy and the title. Um, I guess I'll have to win draft match to do that, though. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, yeah, I'll catch you next time.